Welcome. This is the 20th Richard Jones Memorial Lecture, and I, I can't quite work out how many of those I've been to or now have helped to organise. But I know that all of the ones I've been to have been enormously challenging and inspiring. And I know because I've been hanging out with John Liu for a, a couple of days now, I know that this will also be challenging and inspiring. I want to welcome, apart from welcoming the whole host of you, and it's nice to see so many smiling, friendly faces in the auditorium and so many old friends and colleagues over the years of activity in this, in this domain. It's good to see you here tonight. Thank you. And I'd like especially to welcome Patsy Jones and Campbell Jones because you're special guests and this lecture is in honour of Richard Jones and we're really glad to have you here. I want to also um, follow our now customary practice of acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. We live and work on land that is Aboriginal <coughs> land, the Moonina people, and we want to acknowledge their traditional links to the land and their custodianship of it over, is it 60,000 years of custodianship of this land we are beneficiaries of now? So we acknowledge their presence and their traditions. We're celebrating here tonight the legacy and life work of Richard Jones, and many of you will actually have known Richard, and I didn't have that, that honour and, and pleasure. But for those of you who didn't know him and who don't know why he should be celebrated, I'm just going to tell you briefly why we should honour him and, and the wonderful achievements that individuals can undertake. And I think our speaker tonight is another example of individual energy and achievement. And we can take inspiration in our own activities and, and mission on, on the planet Earth from these individuals. So I'm just going to read to you the statement that's on the Richard Jones Memorial Lecture website. And thank you to Todd, wherever he is, for bringing us into the, the early 21st century and making a website for the Richard Jones Memorial Lecture. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Richard Jones was a man of foresight, courage, and conviction. He translated his knowledge as an ecologist into action to defend our planet's future. He was a founder and president at the time of his death in March 1986 of the Tasmanian Environment Centre, now Sustainable Living Tasmania, an organisation most of you will know, I know and love. <laughs> um, he was the main protagonist attempting to save Lake Pedder from flooding in the Middle Gordon hydroelectric scheme. And as part of that, he formed the world's first environmentally based political party, the United Tasmania Group, to highlight issues by contesting elections. Dr. Jones believed firmly in a research basis for decisions and encouraged research focus, focusing on issues important for the future. This is so appropriate to John's talk tonight. He promoted the foundation of the Centre for Environmental Studies at the University of Tasmania, where postgraduates could study new disciplines and conduct research. He was its director until his death. In recognition of his work, Dr. Jones was made a life member of the Australian Conservation Foundation in 1982, and he was one of the people responsible for turning the um, ACF into a, a really um, proactive and visionary, um, uh, feisty organisation um, from the rather more conservative um, organisation it was before he shook it up a bit. I think shaking things up a bit from the stories I've heard of, of Dick Jones, shaking things up a bit is something he did very well, eh, hey, Patsy? Yes? <laughs> we need that. So this is the 20th Memorial Lecture. 
And we've had an amazingly challenging and inspiring series um, over the course of the... It hasn't been 20 years because you may have noticed there have there've been gaps. The committee is a voluntary committee and we sometimes don't quite get our act together to, to find um, inspiring speakers for you, but I'm sure you won't be disappointed tonight. And let me introduce to you John D. Yu. But I've just realised that I need to do something else before I do that. Um, I have to do the housekeeping stuff, which is to identify Aidan Davison, who is the per Would you please stand, Aidan? Sorry to do this to you. Aidan is the person we all have to slavishly obey if there is some reason to evacuate the theatre. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes, I can't imagine that will happen, but the man in the striped shirt is the one to whose orders we follow. Back to introducing John Liu. John's uh, an American who's lived in China for more than 30 years. And uh, when I asked him how he wanted to be introduced, he said he, he, he wants to be described as doing what he can to be useful. He has worked, um, he first went to China to open the CBS News Bureau in Beijing at the time of the normalization of relations between the US and China. And it seems, although he travels a great deal, he actually has not left China. And he is, it is now, at the moment, his home. So he's been involved in TV, China, and ecology, global ecology. And he's a senior research fellow with the IUCN and director of the Environmental Education and Media Project. He's travelled the world filming and speaking passionately about how we might restore the natural ecosystems of the world in a way that will enable us to live well um, and will ensure our future. He has a very important message for us. If you want to know more about him, you can go to our website, to the Richard Jones Memorial Lecture website. Um, but I won't continue any longer. Um, John, it's your turn now. Please welcome John Liu. Oh dear. Um, hello, everyone. I hope I won't disappoint you. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. And it's a great honor to be asked to give this lecture, and especially because it's in memory of someone who's done something so extraordinary. Thank you. This is me. Uh, I'm going to dim the lights, if you don't mind. Now I'm told, be careful on the stairs if you have to leave. Um, anyone can get my email and contact me. I'd be happy to correspond. I have to thank also these organizations who support my research and work now. And I'm going to get one of those Formula One suits because over the last 15 years, we have gotten some support from different organizations. And I'm going to talk to you about human history, but I'm going to talk about the Chinese history first because in 1995, I was asked and actually assigned to go and begin to document this area, which is called the Lus Plateau. It covers parts of seven different uh, provinces in northwestern China, starting up in Qinghai and then Gansu, Ningxia, parts of Inner Mongolia, the two different Shanxi provinces, double A Shanxi and single A Shanxi. I can never say them in Chinese. They sound exactly the same to me. And Hebei, a part of, oh no, a, a piece of Henan, I think. 
And um, it looks like this. And this is Lus. It's a soil type. The geomorphology of this soil is that glaciers moving in the high Himalayas crushed the rocks and it was deposited by wind on the plateau below. And these are the largest Lus deposits in the world. Now, this is a very minerally rich material, but it requires carbon in order to be fertile. And because of where it is, you might find some interesting things if you dig about. It was the, the uh, center of power and affluence for the early dynasties, the Han, the Qin, the Tang. This is to the southwest in Sichuan, and it's a fully functional ecosystem, forested ecosystem. This is to the northeast in Mongolia, and it's a fully functional grassland ecosystem. And there's a lot of evidence that it was in a mixed forest and grassland ecosystem where the Chinese race began. Now, Chinese scholars believe that humans and their ancestors have been in this area for one and a half million years. And scholars generally believe this is the second place on Earth where settled agriculture began. So in 1995, when I was assigned to film this, this is what I found. It was a fully degraded ecosystem. There was virtually no vegetative cover. And I was astonished that the largest ethnic group on the planet could come from a place that was this fundamentally ecologically destroyed. And at that time, I was not a PhD student studying soil and interactions of ecological function, and I didn't understand how this had happened. So it started a very, very long inquiry, which continues. I've some would, my family and close friends would say that I'm now obsessed with this. But what I found was that the development trajectory for the Chinese was that they cut the trees. And when the trees were gone, they tried slope farming on the hillsides. And when that naturally depleted the fertility of the soils, they tried free ranging of goats and sheep until everything was lost. And this started a cycle of poverty and ecological destruction that ultimately was increased or passed down from generation to generation. So the more the people did in this way, degrading their ecosystem, the worse the situation became. And it turns out that studying the Chinese uh, development trajectory is pretty interesting because it's very close to all the other cradles of civilization. So this is human history. Human beings about 10,000 years ago began to disrupt the the landscapes through settled agriculture. Now, this has caused a lot of strange impacts. This one is very odd. This is the effect of 1.6 billion tons of sediments going into the river. And it's become so odd that tourists now go to see this phenomenon. This is also the type of, of conditions which cause massive dust storms. And these dust storms pick up the loose soils and, and fill the air. 
This is Beijing, where I live in one of the terrible dust storms. But this is not simply a local problem. This is a, creates a particulate layer in the atmosphere, and it can be tracked around the world. So these sediments are going everywhere. Please, you've just come in, have a seat. <laughs> but be careful on the stairs. <laughs> Um, now, what's especially interesting is that the Chinese over the last 30 years have been very precocious. And they decided, we're going to fix the Lus Plateau. Now that's somehow counterintuitive, because if you stand on a mountaintop and you look in 360 degrees and you don't see any vegetation, the first thing you, you think of is not, let's fix it. But they decided to use geographical information systems, and they mapped every watershed in the plateau. Then they used enterprise software to track all the investments and interventions, and they used participatory assessment mechanisms to engage the local population in the inquiry and ultimately into the intervention. Let me tell you, they made a decision. And the decision they made was to differentiate ecological and economic land. And so this is all of the people being engaged into terracing. But this is not a terracing project. They, they did an integrated approach, so they infiltrated rainfall. They differentiated and designated ecological and economic land, which meant they released large areas to ecology and reduced the area which could be worked as agricultural land. And they planted a lot of trees and plants. I'm going to freeze this for just a moment and, and add a couple of things. By differentiating and designating, they did this because they made an econometric evaluation. They decided that the ecological function was more valuable than the production. This is a very interesting thought. If this were applied, and this has made me consider this for quite a long time. Now, the people here are benefiting in numerous ways. They're getting paid for their labor, which actually works quite well when you're transitioning people away from subsistence agriculture. And what the Chinese have proved is you can do this instantly. You don't need to wait decades or generations. And the people are ready to leave subsistence agriculturalist, uh, agriculture. And I would actually suggest that all of our ancestors were subsistence agriculturalists. So there's plenty of evidence that you can leave subsistence. And then they're, they're learning new sustainable agricultural techniques and they're going to own the output from the fields. So mainly their interest is, oh no, I have to stop this. Um, you're going to forgive me for a moment. So, so again, uh, they began to differentiate and designate by analyzing. And so this is part of what was lost. So one of the things that they found was that um, any slope over 25 degrees, they determined that the ecosystem function would be more valuable than the production. And this allowed them to draw lines on their GIS maps. So what you see is areas which are going to be released for nature. And the areas for agriculture are going to be seriously reduced. So he's pointing at the areas which we highly invested for 
improvement of agriculture, but the trade-off is outside the lines, it'll be released to nature. Again, you saw this, but what, and their, again, their motivation is mainly self-interested because they're being paid, they're learning new sustainable agricultural methods, and they're going to own the output from the new fields. But the area, the active project area, was 35,000 square kilometers. So the active project area was the size of Belgium. And when you talk about size like that, it isn't simply production and consumption or individual income or community income. It reaches the scale which affects hydrology, weather, and climate. And I think this is a very important fact as we look at some of the things which are affecting us today. So this is the part about how we got there. <laughs> and this is a little bit about where we're going. So in, in uh, 2009, we made a film for the C Copenhagen conference. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Well, they did a pretty good job. And this has made me very philosophical. And I started to think about geologic time. And I realized that there was no living materials on the planet and that the atmosphere was poisonous, really, from our perspective. And that the earth was transformed by biological life into a beautiful garden. And this took place, I, I don't know the times, but it's something like 4.567 billion years. And this is the engine. It's a biochemical photoreactive process which converts sunlight and water and minerals into living material. And throughout evolutionary time, there's been a constant accumulation of organic material and an increase, a constant increase in biomass. And this has produced all of the spheres. Basically, the biosphere has altered the lithosphere into the pedosphere, the cryosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. And it's astonishing the power of these evolutionary trends toward biodiversity, biomass, and organic materials. And the idea that we could create a machine that could sequester carbon better than a biochemical photoreactive process that's developed over billions of years is ridiculous. All of the carbon was removed from the atmosphere in this way. And very, very recently into this timeline, human beings emerged as the dominant species. 
And about maybe 35 or 40,000 years ago, we learned how to hunt. And we were very good at it. I think we probably studied some other species who were good at it. And we drove the big megafauna on most continents to extinction. But about 10,000 years ago, we began to do slash and burn agriculture. And we, in doing this, in all these cases, we began to interrupt the long-term evolutionary trends. This is in Ethiopia just a few years ago. So you can go and find slash and burn agriculture and basically Neolithic agriculture being used today. So from a scientific perspective, we know what's happening when you do this. You're reducing the biodiversity, you're reducing the biomass, and you're reducing the accumulation of organic matter. And if you follow this development trajectory, it leads to ecosystem collapse. And now, in many parts of the world, similar to what we saw in the Lys Plateau, are, are huge areas which are completely ruined. They have high sediment loads in the rivers. They have flooding followed by drought, followed by famine. It's a typical and logical outcome to these kinds of behaviors. And every, every civilization that followed this development trajectory ended in collapsing its ecosystem and in the failure of the civilization. But in the past, the, the center of power and affluence could move to someplace else. But now, we're at the place where we have seven billion people and we're adding approximately a billion people every 12 years. So there's no way for the center of power and affluence to move to some other place on Earth. And the indicators are that we're affecting global ecological systems, the oceans, the atmosphere, the climate. As a result of its success, the lessons learned from the Lus Plateau rehabilitation are now being applied all over China. But could such projects work elsewhere in less centrally controlled societies with fewer resources and different soils? Ethiopia, perhaps more than any other country, has come to symbolize the vulnerability of humankind to environmental catastrophe. This is a country whose problems have been increased by war and civil conflict. And now, human-induced climate change is predicted to make matters worse. As on the Lus Plateau, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. In just six years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. So essentially, what 
I've been looking at is the fact that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. But this doesn't mean that we should degrade <laughs> ecosystems because they can be restored. It means that the value of, of functional ecosystems is extremely high. And there is a pathway emerging that tells us a, a, a pathway towards sustainability. So if I consider the development trajectory for the Luz Plateau, essentially they began to degrade their system. And it, it led ultimately to ecosystem collapse, and this is typical. But what's different is that the Chinese made an intervention which is changing the outcomes. So this is very important. We have to analyze what it is that we're doing, which is leading to collapse, and we have to think about this paradigm shift, this place where we can determine to go in a different direction. Now, all of these different things are, are dynamic. It turns out that we determine. So the natural systems, the Earth, actually, the natural evolutionary trends are toward accumulation and abundance and robustness and resilience. And it's when we interrupt those trends that we create the dysfunctional uh, trajectory. So if you question this, is it inevitable that these areas degrade? The answer seems to be no. It's not a biophysical thing. It's human greed and human ignorance that causes this. So this leads us to consider what, who are we? What are we, what, 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 is, what, is, what is the nature, what is human nature? And some people have said, well, it's, you know, human nature, people are selfish. But I've now been to almost 80 countries around the world. And my experience is that people are not necessarily selfish. They have selfish impulses. But they also have tremendous empathy. If, they, if everything that human beings did was selfish, then it wouldn't at all be the way the world is. Uh-oh. Many things that I've seen in Rwanda remind me of some of the things that I've seen in China. The Chinese government was asking this generation and all the generations alive today to change the course of human history, to take those denuded, the denuded landscape that they, they had and somehow alter this. I'm going to present to you about places. Let's just say they took it seriously, because this could go on for a while. This is a letter that says, thank you for coming and sharing this information. That's very nice. But this is a letter that says they've rewritten their land use policy laws, and they're asking for international assistance to restore the entire country. Last year, IUCN's uh, director for forests and the executive director of the UN Forum on Forests signed an MOU, and this year, in February, the Rwanda Forest and Landscape Restoration Initiative to restore the entire country, um, all degraded land in Rwanda was signed at the United Nations. Now, it's interesting because Rwanda is 27,000 square kilometers. The active project area of the Lis Plateau was 35,000 square kilometers. So the entire country of Rwanda is only two-thirds the size of the project in China. Given the fact that about $500 million was invested in the Chinese one over 10 years, then the cost of this is in the area perhaps of, well, probably because of inflation, around four or five hundred million dollars. Ooh. See, when you come into a natural environment, like this African rainforest here in Rwanda, 
You can't help but notice the differences in humidity, temperature, and even the level of oxygen. The difference between this environment and a human-altered environment is the profusion of biodiversity, the enormous amounts of biomass, and everywhere is decaying organic matter. In many places that are now considered among the poorest places on Earth, relatively small populations live on large areas of land. The rights of the indigenous peoples and their unique cultures have often been affected as the growing global production and consumption model has imposed itself virtually everywhere. Here on the inner Niger Delta in Mali, it's possible to see the effects of valuing productivity over function. We fail to understand that the Earth's water, its unique species of life, and its climate are regulated from places just like this. When these systems are fully functional, everybody on Earth benefits. But if we fail to value these essential functions, the local people are forced to degrade them just to survive. What's the value of the Earth's water, or biodiversity, or climate regulation? How can we consign to poverty those of us whose task it is to protect these essential functions? Acknowledging the real value of ecosystems could profoundly improve the prospects for hundreds of millions of the world's poorest people. This is an interesting thing. This is Yoda. Uh, you, you'll meet Yoda in a moment. This is the, the Bomburi cement quarry in Mombasa in Kenya. And they're stripping off the soils to expose calcium carbonates, which they're mining. And these are removed and crushed into aggregate for cement and it leaves bedrock, and below the bedrock is saline water. So it's pretty much some of the worst conditions that you could have for restoration. This is Rene Holler, he is Yoda. And he's a Swiss individual who has been living in Africa since 1960. He's taking the slag heaps there and he's digging deep trenches to infiltrate water. And then he went looking for a tree species that was saline tolerant. And he found an Australian one, <laughs> uh, Casarina <coughs> pine. And he, then he discovered a millipede that lives in symbiosis by eating mainly the needles of Casarina pine. And he is creating humus on bedrock. And he's done this over vast areas. And he's shown that you can now balance the freshwater because the densities between the freshwater and the saltwater are different. Here he's explaining about the stomata, which closed down in the daytime to uh, reduce evaporation. And he has wonderful outcomes. Now he's working to transfer this knowledge to small holder farmers in Africa. So if, if you can build soils on bedrock, you can do this better in areas where it hasn't become that completely destroyed. We sent a graduate student to Rene and all of his, all of the papers that have been written since 1960 at, at his, about his work have been uh, digitized now and are on the web. So I think it's, uh, well, Rene Holler, Holler Foundation. And so, we need to do something. We need to change the way we've been acting. 
And we need to realize that ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services. I, I want to ask, does anybody disagree with that? Does anybody believe that production and consumption of goods and services is more valuable than ecosystem function? Show of hands. No one? <laughs> Singapore. And I'm currently living in Singapore, and I must admit they believe in their BMWs and Mercedes Benzers and getting the test book. Do you believe in? Did no. I? I, I suffer. <laughs> I suffer. Well, okay, so now. Let, let's, let's do something. My slides are all out of order now. So um, let me, let me g go off script here and, and ask, all right, so if ecosystem function is more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services, what does that mean? What, what does it what, what, in, in fact, let's ask it another way. What is money? A tool. So it's a means of exchange. And it's an agreed upon means of exchange. And it's a storehouse of value. Is that right? So it's a belief system. So it reflects what we value. Is that right? So, if money reflects what we value, if we now analyze the global economy, we'd have to say that we value production and consumption of goods and services higher than we do ecosystem function because ecosystem function is zero in the global economy. But production and consumption represents the GDP. So our global economy reflects the sum total of all the things which are produced and consumed on Earth. But this is illogical because all of the goods and services are extracted from functional ecosystems. And when the functional ecosystems become dysfunctional, you don't get any production and you don't get any services. So how could the products and services be worth more than the functional systems? They can't. It's wrong. So our economy is based on a flaw in logic. Yeah? Well, I, I think mining reflects a traditional relative, I mean, it's, it's not even necessarily that old, although, you know, in, it, it depends on your baseline. So if your baseline is evolutionary time, then it's quite different. But if your baseline is neoclassical economic theory, then that goes back a few hundred years. And of course, it depends on civilization, which civilization you come from, because for many indigenous peoples all over the world, they were never asked, do you, do you agree that money and wealth is derived from production and consumption? And really, if you analyze their, their legends and their, their cultures, you'd have to say, no, they don't believe that. Yes? I think you're presenting a false dichotomy in some ways, because if you take your example of the first fellow in China, uh, what you've got there is a restoration of a functioning ecosystem, but you also, as a result of that, got the production of goods and services. They are not, uh, you know, trade-offs uh, as a dichotomy. They can go go together, and that's surely what the concept of ecologically sustainable development is. It's uh, increasing our uh, production of goods and services but also in a way that uh, 
doesn't uh, destroy the ecosystems on which it all depends. Yes. Yes. I, I think that this is not an either or uh, question. So function doesn't eliminate production. Actually, function increases productivity. Um, but I think there is still something terribly flawed about our economic thinking because we have defined money and the ec economic system as production and consumption of goods and services. And there are three problems with this. First is we create a, a perverse incentive to degrade the ecosystems because we pay people for production and consumption, but we value the functional ecosystems at zero. That's why we're looking for sustainable development because now development is unsustainable. But second is the fact that the, you can't infinitely extract from a finite system. So now you need constant growth in the economy forever. But this is impossible. So actually, everybody is saying it's impossible. You can't constantly grow this economy. And thirdly, it's unfair. So there are at least a half of the world's population who are excluded from this. And they've never been asked. And they are poor only because they don't manufacture or consume manufactured goods. And when, if you looked at the Mali thing, Mali has 14 million people in an area twice the size of France. And the inner Niger Delta floods up to six meters over a vast area every year. And in the human development indicators, they are just about the lowest. They're like three above the, uh, from the bottom. How could they possibly be poor? And they have to cut the vegetative cover in Mali in order to extract something to sell if they want to buy a pair of tennis shoes or a bicycle or a radio. Because the world has said, your ecosystem function is worth nothing. Unless you produce and consume things, you're nothing. Well, this is simply wrong because their ecosystem function is more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services because I love my little apple things, but they only last a few years. And then they have to be very carefully disassembled because they're filled with toxic materials. And so how could they be more valuable than the hydrological regulation which is going on in Mali. It's not possible at all. And so we've created this economy which is causing a perverse incentive to degrade. And what's interesting about this is I have been looking now for 16 years to find out whether there are biophysical reasons why the ecosystems must degrade. And I don't find any. There's no physical reason the natural evolutionary trends would be to accumulate organic materials, to increase the amounts of biomass. Only human beings change this. And by changing this, we've altered something where we thought we we're producing something, we're making something, we're making it better. But actually, we're interrupting long-term evolutionary trends, which are the basis of air, water, food, and energy. So we haven't quite got that one right yet. But these are some of the scientific implications that I'm finding. That the hydrological function is related to the total amounts and the percentages of biomass and the total amounts and the percentages of accumulated organic matter. Now, and that all of these things are dynamic. That if we are interested in combating desertification or ensuring food security, then we're going to need soil moisture and fertility. And the way to have that is to understand where they come from. 
And of course, interestingly, it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. Now, the Chinese have learned this, and they have planted 50, over 56 billion trees since 1978. So this is two and a half times the rest of the world combined. And they are massively growing their economy. Now, you could say that it's because of foreign direct investment and industrialization that they're, they're improving their economy. And to some extent, this is true. But we've gone to Rwanda in 2006. They've accepted that, that their development is connected to the percentages of biomass and percentages of organic matter. They have the fastest growing economy in, in East Africa. Over the last five, six years, it's seven and a half percent in, the, in a global recession. And while their neighbors are facing terrible ecological disruptions. So all of these things are dynamic. And then we start to see these economic implications. So I think if everybody could say, now if you don't believe it, you can't say it. But if you believe it, then please say, ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services. Can anybody say that? Can anybody say that? How would you say that? You say, ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services. Now, let me, let me posit something. If everybody in the world could say that, suddenly our economy and our money would no longer be based on production and consumption of goods and services because money reflects what we value. So if we were to recognize that we value ecosystem function and that not simply do we value it, it just intrinsically is more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services, then we would have turned a corner in terms of our human consciousness and evolution. Because if we did this, now we see what, what is the result of, of believing that money comes from production and consumption of goods and services. It means that we exclude half of the people of the earth from our economy, because, and they will never catch up. So they can always be the janitors or the whatever, but they can never really catch up. I mean, a few can we need to rise up, I suppose. But then if, if ecosystem function is the basis of the economy, it's much more fair. And furthermore, in the developed world, not simply in the developing world, but in the developed world, look at the, at the cars in the, at the time, at the rush hour, going to work. Where's everybody going? They're going to make money. They're going to make money so they can produce and consume things. And this is causing the creation of huge deserts and exploitation of masses of, of resources. Is that development trajectory going to be able to continue? It's, it's impossible. So how do we turn the whole thing in another direction? How do we ensure that everyone's efforts go toward conservation and restoration? So it's not simply, it's not enough for a few kind individuals to take on environmentalism and the rest of the people are producing and consuming as much as they can and, and the politicians are telling us, oh, it's a global recession, buy more. You know, let, let's get out of this, let's go shopping. It's crazy. So that isn't going to work. And what is going to work, and what does happen if not necessarily everybody on Earth, but a critical mass of people 
could say ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services. This is a flat earth, round earth moment. So if, if the world, if, if the empiric scientific evidence tells people who are considering it that the earth is round, but the societal dogma says the earth is flat, who's right? And what ultimately has to happen is that the, the, the society says, well, the earth is round. And we are there now because actually our economy suggests that production and consumption of goods and services is more valuable than ecosystem function. But it's not. So this is, we're in the flat earth period and we need to move to the round earth. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty good here. Um, so we badly need a new paradigm. And I think in looking over the years at this biophysical aspects, I've been thinking, is, is it inevitable that they degrade? Do we, must we degrade? And I found that no, we don't have to. And I found that China, China's not the first example of massive restoration. There's a much bigger example. America, from 1933 to 1942, had 5% of American males working in conservation. They made 400 parks. They, they restored grasslands and planted huge forests. And in the second half of the 20th century, America was the dominant power. Look what's happening now in China. Isn't that bizarre? But, but what, what's strange about this is both of these countries are acting as if this is a national security issue. But this isn't simply a national security issue. This is an issue where the whole world, we're, we're degrading global ecosystems. We're affecting the oceans, the atmosphere, and the climate. This is not a national issue. We need a species response. We need to act as a species on a planetary scale. And in order to do that, we have to decide what do we believe? What do we think is correct? And if ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services, and everybody here can say that, honestly, and go and get another 10 people <laughs> to say that, and they go to get another 10 people to say that, and pretty soon, everybody in the world is going, hey, I want to come or go someplace, and I want somebody to come up to me and say, you know what, ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services, and I've got a crazy feeling that pretty soon this is what's going to happen. Because I started talking about infiltration and retention of rainfall and the role of organic materials and biomass in Africa, and people were looking at me like, what are you talking about? Several countries are, are moving in this direction. All of the United Nations conventions, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the, the Convention on Combating Desertification are incorporating this thinking. So if we move forward with this, then we will have a paradigm shift because money simply reflects what we value. And when we get to the point where everyone can say ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than the production and consumption of goods and services. So there's your mantra. Don't be Jeff Goldblum in uh, Annie Hall and say, I forgot my mantra. Remember it. So, Deng Xiaoping, I had the fortune to interview him together with Mike Wallace for 60 Minutes in 1986. And uh, he said, you have to learn truth from facts. So they stopped being ideological. 
in China. They became completely pragmatic. And so if, we, if we're going to lose ideology and think about what is true, then I say ecosystem function is vastly more valuable than production and consumption of goods and services. And repeating it isn't a bad idea. And I think we have some moral implications. The, the other thing that I've noticed is that if ecosystem function is valued higher than production and consumption of goods and services, everything changes. This isn't carbon sequestration, which imagines that our only problem is carbon disequilibrium in the atmosphere, which is not actually the case. We have massive deserts. We have hydrological dysfunction. We have extreme weather. We have ocean um, acidification, thermal expansion. Species die out. We have all kinds of problems. We have terrorism. We have population increases. If we in included all of the people who live at the edges of large degraded ecosystems in vocational training for ecological restoration, and we added family planning, women's rights, and, concept, and, 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 and access to contraception, we would immediately turn the birth rates flat because it's happened everywhere where there are women's rights, access to contraception, and family planning. So why aren't we doing this? And the only reason not to do this is because of the economic system. Because we, the society suggests that money and the economy are based on production and consumption of goods and services. And by the way, Marx, not Karl, I mean Groucho, no, no, not Groucho, Karl, you know, th basically, I've lived in China for 32 years. I've been three times to North Korea. I was all over the Soviet Union and East Europe as a journalist. This was state capitalism, not communism. So we, we, need to, we need to think about this. So what is the pathway to sustainability? Is there a way that we can, before everybody leaves, um, is there a way we can get there? So. I think I, I'm going to stop because I could show you more. I could show, I don't want to go there anymore. Don't do that. I don't want to do this. Go, go on, do something, move on from there. So I, I could show you additional things, but I won't because it's, it's gone dark. <laughs> Everything is dark now. So, oh, that was a good one. <laughs> we could leave it there. So, what I think would happen if everyone understood that ecosystem function was more valuable than production and consumption is that everything would change. So, thank you for listening, and I'm ready to answer questions.